Hi, I'm Jeremy here with Dr. Danny Faulkner. He's our astronomer here at ANSYS in Genesis. And we are in the observatory right now with all these telescopes. And we have a question that many people have been searching for on Google. And they are finding our article on the subject, which you wrote, what will happen on September 23rd, 2017. So Dr. Faulkner, if you could take it away from here and answer that question for us, I'd be grateful. All right. Well, the short answer to the question is probably nothing <laughs> really important will happen that day. That hasn't stopped people from getting very excited. Uh, this has been traveling around on the Internet with our numerous articles and YouTube videos and such about it. And it's uh, people's interpretation of uh, Revelation 12, verses 1 and 2. And I'll very briefly paraphrase what it says. It said John wrote that there was a sign in the sky, and it was a woman clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet, with a crown of 12 stars on her head, and she was about to give birth. And so many people are thinking that this will literally be fulfilled on, um, September, on September 23rd here in 2017. Now, what they mean by that is they, you have this constellation Virgo, which is a woman. And uh, on that date, the sun will be in the upper part of that constellation. So in a way, she's kind of clothed with light. And the moon will be down near her feet, or at least the part of the constellation representing her feet. And the, um, the planet Jupiter will be located near the midsection of her, near where a woman's womb would be, and that would represent the child. And then above her head, there's this, the constellation Leo, and it has nine stars, and then there are three naked eye planets, look like bright stars, Mercury, Venus, and, uh, and um, Mars. And you add those three with a nine, you get 12, that's the crown, and it all comes together to be some great apocalyptic sign. Now, what does that sign mean? Well, most of them don't tell you exactly what it is. Some of them will say, well, I think it's the return of the Lord on that date, or the next day, or within, within 10 days or so. Others just kind of leave you hanging with the obvious implication that that is their intent. Let's take a look at this, just deconstruct it and see what actually is going on here. Uh, is there a, a Virgo, a constellation in the sky? Yes, there is, and it does lie along the ecliptic. It's one of those zodiacal constellations, and so each year the moon traverses uh, through those constellations, since there are 12 of them, the sun sends about one month in each one of those. So every year, September, early October, the sun is indeed in the constellation Virgo, but again for about a month every year. Now, the moon, it, uh, it takes about a month. In fact, that's the definition of a month. It takes 27 and a third days to uh, orbit the Earth with respect to the stars. So that means it lines up in the same location roughly every 27 and a third days, or roughly a month. So once a month, the, the planet, uh, the, excuse me, the moon will be near the, what we call would be the face of the, uh, near the feet of, of Virgo. So on the 23rd of September this year, the sun will be in Virgo, and the moon will be in the lower part of uh, Virgo representing the feet. So, oh, so far, so good. Now, as far as, the, uh, uh, as Jupiter representing the child, I think that's a bit of a Rorschach test. Uh, where did they get the idea this has to be a child? I don't know. That's just something people made up and kept repeating it. But let's not even argue with that. That's, that's pretty thin, I think, but I'll just let that one go. Now, Jupiter takes 11.8 years to orbit around the stars with respect to the, the Earth. That's the orbital period of the Sun, and also it goes back and forth, uh, what we call retrograde motion in between each year. But it takes about one year to go through one constellation. So the uh, planet Jupiter is indeed in the constellation Virgo this year. As it was 12 years ago in 2005, and 12 years before that in 1993, uh, and so forth, in the past. In fact, I, I point out to people, I first saw uh, Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, uh, in the constellation Virgo, actually, uh, 48 years ago, uh, in 1969. So that year it was kind of fulfilled as well, if you waited until September when the, when the moon was also there. Now, what about the um, nine stars in Leo? Well, this is where they really lose me on this one. This gets repeated so many times that uh, there are nine stars in the constellation Leo uh, that most people just assume that that's true. In fact, I've had people argue with me about this. Folks, I'm a professional astronomer. I have a PhD in astronomy. I taught astronomy and physics for over a quarter century at a university. But long before that, I was an amateur astronomer. I've been a student of the skies for nearly a half century. Pretty serious. 
and Telescope. Their monthly star chart used to put nine stars together to make up Leo. But a number of years ago, they changed. Now they have 13. I have a planisphere I bought nearly a half century ago. It shows, planet, uh, shows the, uh, all the constellations in the northern hemisphere, including uh, Leo, and it shows 10 stars, the way I like to see it done. Here at the Creation Museum, our planetarium has a Digistar 5 system. We have 10 stars being displayed. So what is it? 9, 10, 13, or some other number uh, out there? Well, there is no hard and fast rule. A man named Claudius Ptolemy in the second century AD codified the constellations for us, wrote them down, and he cataloged far more than 9, 10, or, or even 13 stars. There are actually scores of stars in Leo. And how you draw them together and which ones you think are important is a matter of personal opinion. Now, what got everybody excited is there's one particular uh, planetarium software, or t desktop planetarium software, I should say, called Stellarium. And if you ask it to um, instruct it to put the uh, lines connecting the stars together in constellations, lo and behold, on Leo it shows nine stars. But it also shows many other stars. So this idea that there are nine stars and only nine stars in Leo, or nine principal stars, is not a matter of fact. It's a matter of opinion. And Stellarium simply happened to do that. Uh, and so I reject the concept that it is uh, nine stars there. And if you add the three, that would get you 12. But if you start with 13, that would get you 16. If you add 10, it would give you 13. Uh, so you've got um, a real problem here trying to make that fit to everything. And uh, contrary to a lot of the claims out there, this thing only happens you know, once every 7,000 years or something. It actually happens more often than that. Having those three planets there in Leo, that's not all that common, I'll have to admit that, but it's not unprecedented. And uh, furthermore, Leo is not that close to Virgo. It's actually some distance away and quite a, quite a stretch, I think, to argue that that is the, uh, a crown on her head. So I'm very, I'm not very, <laughs> I'm very pessimistic about this meaning much of anything. Uh, my, uh, my knowledge of astronomy tells me otherwise, and I'm also a student of history. I've been, uh, for the past 45 years, going through a regular cycle of people declaring the end of the world. I recently calculated, uh, counted up, I've been through at least nine ends of the world in my adult lifetime. This will be number 10 this time around. So folks, let's, let's just calm down a little bit. Let's don't get upset. Let's just sit back and think about this very carefully and pray about it. And more importantly, let's wait until September 24th to maybe have a conversation about it. If I'm wrong, I'll be happy to admit I'm wrong. But all these other people out there, if they're wrong, will they be happy to admit that they are wrong or will they just sort of forget about all of this? You know, so many of these conversations, we forget the most important thing. You know, the Lord himself, Lord Jesus himself, and Matthew talked about the fact of the end of the world and the signs of the end of the times. And he said, don't stand around, didn't say stand around looking for these signs so you can figure out what day it will happen. He says, because nobody will know the day, nobody will know the hour, nobody will know the time. He, the important point is that we need to be ready. So the big question is, whether it's September 23rd or not, are you ready? Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live in Los Angeles with James Jacob Prash via Skype. And Jacob, it's September 25th. Do you know where your children are? Yes, it's September 25th, meaning the 23rd of September is over and the 24th of September is over. Gee, I had a big going away party for nothing. Once again, the boy cried wolf. Once again, the body of Christ has been discredited by crackpots setting dates, something Jesus said not to do. Y2K, Y2K, the late Harold Camping. Then there was Mark Biltz and his blood moons. Mark Biltz marketed himself as some kind of a messianic leader, and his background is not even Jewish. Then we have September 23rd. One of the things that grieves me the most is when Satan sees God doing something, Satan seeks to counterfeit it in order to undermine what God is really doing. So many of the people at the forefront of what is happening today are increasingly Jewish believers. Romans 11 tells us the natural branches will be grafted in again. So we have the leading evangelical Christian astronomer in the world, 
internationally recognized. He's on the BBC, Dr. Daniel Bach, a Jewish believer in Yeshua. Instead of listening to him concerning the astronomy of September 23rd, we listen to ridiculous crackpots who weren't even astronomers, who didn't even know or care that three of the stars were not stars but planets. But then we have messianic people plugging this nonsense. Why would you listen to a messianic crackpot when you have one of the leading astronomers in the world who is a believer? If you want a Jewish perspective, talk to a Jewish believer who's an astronomer. Dr. Bach did not promote this stuff. There was an astronomer on Answers in Genesis, another evangelical astronomer. He explains how it's all nonsense. We have some excellent Messianic Jewish theologians, born again, evangelical, saved believers in Yeshua. Dr. Darrell Bach, Dallas Seminary. Dr. Conrad Gemp, London School of Theology. Dr. Michael Rydelnik, Moody Bible Institute. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Ariel Ministries. Excellent messianic Bible expositors who are properly qualified theologically, who know Hebrew and Greek. But we're listening to crackpots. Asher Intrader, Dan Juster, crackpots. Is there a supernatural dimension? A world beyond the one we know? Is there life after death? Do angels exist? Can our dreams contain messages from heaven? Can we tap into ancient secrets of the supernatural? Are healing miracles real? Sid Roth has spent over 35 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome, welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. I just love the rarefied air of heaven, the supernatural of God, the presence of God. I have a question for you. Why? are the Jewish feasts removed from Christianity? Uh, let me pose it a little different. They're, they are Jewish feasts, but they're not just Jewish feasts. They're biblical feasts. But God says in Leviticus, he calls them my feasts. So they're God's feasts. So why were the Jewish, biblical, God, feasts removed from Christianity. It's a question to ponder. Now, there's only one person that benefits for these being removed if, as you're about ready to find out, they clearly show what is going to happen in the end times in mystery code, just as the first few feasts that are God's feast show the whole first coming of Jesus. The last feast show the return of Jesus. Who benefits by keeping believers ignorant? I have Perry Stone here. And uh, Perry, the last time that I interviewed him, he brought someone with him, his father who is now in heaven. And his father operated in all nine gifts of the Spirit. And I asked Perry the last time I spoke with him, did your father have a prophetic word just before he died? And you answered? He said the Lord spoke to him, and this is about uh, a month before he passed, that in the last days, as we come closer to the time of the end, Believers were going to come under a lot of stress, a lot of satanic temptation. And he said, 
some of this will be temptations that people have never dealt with. He said godly people. He said some of it will be sexual temptations with thoughts in their mind to do things they've never thought of doing. He said the only, and he was crying when he told me this, mm -hmm. and he said, please tell them that the Lord said they have to pray excessively in the Holy Spirit. They have to use the prayer language of the Spirit, and when they're under temptation, don't try to fight it just by, by rebuking it in your nat natural tongue. Fight it by praying heavy in the Spirit of God to re get your mind renewed. I, I, that, was the, that was one of the last things I, I have to tell you, Perry. I feel like I don't want to go out in the world unless I've prayed for about an hour in tongues. And I've been doing this now for the last few years, and I've been urging everyone else, but yes. I didn't know that prophetic yeah. word. Okay, Perry has spent 80,000, listen to me, 80,000 hours studying the Word of God. Perry is one of the pioneers of what is known as the Jewish Roots Movement. Perry comes from, is it three generations? Four generations. Four generations of people in ministry. He has something that you must understand. Tell me how you first got interested in Israel and even the Jewish roots, because if you come from the background that I think you do, you didn't even hear a lot about the Old Testament. The only thing I heard growing up was Pentecost, because that was the background right. of our group. I didn't know anything about Passover. I didn't know unleavened. I, didn't, I did, probably didn't hear unleavened bread till I was in my twenties. And the, the, what triggered me was a trip to Israel, the very first trip I made. And I saw some things that I won't have time to go into detail with, the earthquake fault line on the Mount of Olives, the, the giant birds that were repopulating up in the Bashan area. And I realized this is all in the Bible, but it wasn't right. being reported here. You know, it's kind of like they knew it there, but it wasn't being reported here. So I started going to Israel, and when I would go, I'd take a photographer to take slide pictures, and I would come back to the States and begin to show, I call it update inside of Israel. And I would begin to show the pictures along with the teaching that the Lord had given me, and it just absolutely became the most popular teaching of the whole week. The largest group of people to attend would come. They would bring unsaved people. A lot of people came to know the Lord because they realized what's written in the Bible is happening. Number one, that makes God's Word real. It makes God real. Number two, it means we're coming into the last days. Feast, so, mm -hmm. where does that fit into it? When did your eyes open up to why the feast in the Bible are so important? It was, pro you know, I started preaching when I was 17. Probably in my 30s, when I really started doing, digging in deep into the Hebraic roots, did I realize that the seven festivals of Israel, the Moedim, the festivals of Israel called the feasts, are convocations of God, but they are appointed seasons. If you look at some of the wording in Hebrew, but also one of the translations in the English Bible will tell you, these are my appointed times. Now, what really got my interest was that Jesus came as the Lamb, but He's coming back as the Lion of Judah. So there's two natures here in one man, the suffering Messiah and the ruling Messiah. Now, those of you maybe you know, watching the program uh, from Israel and you have a rabbi, one of the things the rabbis teach is that there is a Messiah coming, but there's two Messiahs, Messiah, son of Joseph, the suffering Messiah, Messiah, son of David. And they even believe that in Jesus' day. But the thing you have to understand is in the Scripture, He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end, the first, the last. The first time He came, He came to fulfill Isaiah 53, the suffering Messiah. But the second time He comes back, He comes back as the Son of David to rule on the throne, the Mashiach, uh, the Son of David. And so if we understand that, then we can better understand that the feasts are divided up into three sections. The three spring feasts are fulfilled through Yeshua, through His resurrection, death, burial, etc. His, his, uh, his coming, His... Uh, uh, appearance to the disciples during first fruits. Pentecost was the birth of the what we call the New Testament church, the ecclesia of the called out ones on Pentecost. But we've not yet quite gotten to the three fall feasts yet. The, that's trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. And when I started really studying this, I said, wait a minute. Uh, they're, not, they're, they're not preaching to me or they're not sharing with me that these three fall feasts are all in prophecy and have not yet happened. Why are we not studying this. And that's what triggered me into studying it, is to realize three of the fall feasts haven't totally taken place yet. Well, you know, Perry mentioned the word in Leviticus 23, convocation. In the Hebrew, that could be translated rehearsals. Now, if you saw the rehearsals for the first coming of the Messiah and they came out to the decimal point, I mean, it, it's uncanny. It's, it, God is so magnificent how God could do this. Wouldn't you like to know what the last, the fall feasts are all about, which will show you to the decimal point everything you need to know about the return of the Messiah? I'll be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural! 
My passion is for you to walk in divine health 24-7. That's why I handpicked my favorite healing scriptures from many translations of the Bible, personalized them for you, and made them available in this free ebook. I want you to meditate or pray out loud these scriptures over your life daily and witness the supernatural healing power of God's kingdom come upon you. Download your free Healing Scriptures ebook now. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, this is Rod here with Perry Stone. And uh, Perry, many Christians say, I don't know about studying those feasts because my Bible says I'm no longer under the law. What would you say to them? You know, we've talked about this before, how that in the Torah, five books of Moses, you know, you have what's called the law of God, ceremonial, sacrificial, and the moral law. The sacrificial law were all the sacrifices, the lambs, the bulls, the rams, the pigeons. That, that is Christ fulfilled the law. He became the final sacrifice, so there's no more sacrifices as far as animals. So that's what the New Testament's talking about. Now, when we talk about the law of God, when it comes to, let's say, the moral law, that's God's character. That's how God wants His people to live. And you have these laws in the Torah that are also, by the way, found in the New Testament. I can show you in the New Testament, you don't kill, you honor your father and mother, you don't commit adultery and fornication. Uh, these, these scriptures that we call the commandments are still, but here's the key. In the New Covenant, they operate off of love, meaning that God says to you, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal, you're not going to commit adultery, you're not going to covet. If you love God with all your heart, you're going to obey those commandments of worshiping God, keeping a Sabbath day to worship Him, and so on, not taking His name in vain. So the, the fact is, the New Covenant, the only change we have is we're operating off of love, meaning if we love people and love God, we're going, to, uh, we're going to follow His Word. It's going to be an automatic thing because He's changed our heart to follow His commandment and His Word. Now, you have found such amazing nuggets <laughs> in the only book, hear me, the only Bible the first church had was what we call the Old Testament. And from that Bible, they were functioning really, really well. Uh, but <laughs> You were talking uh, about the blood moons, mm -hmm. and this gives us an insight into yeah. the timing of what's happening on planet Earth. Well, several, several years ago, in fact, it was in the 1990s, I began to study a verse that's very complicated in the sense of how do you interpret it. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Right. In, 19, uh, in the 1960s, when they had the moon landing, a woman from my dad's church says, that's the pro prophecy fulfillment. The Russians are going to go to the moon. The Americans are going to go to the moon. They're going to kill each other. It's going to be, I don't know if you ever heard that theory. <laughs> no. And I thought, I mean, how they're going to kill each other when you swing a sword, you have to swing it so slow, slow, the guy can dodge it. Or if you shoot a, I mean, I was just saying to myself, this doesn't make sense. I, what I did, I studied it from a rabbinical perspective. Now, in the rabbinical perspective, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. A solar eclipse is when the moon looks orange or looks blood. Those are uh, signs. For example, lunar eclipses. Now, here's the thing you got to understand. We're not just making this up. Rabbis have actually traced this down for hundreds of years, and they've noticed that during certain solar eclipses, things follow in the world. For example, earthquakes often follow, famines often follow, or global wars often follow. With Jews, they discovered that when a moon, the moon turns to blood, if it happens on a major feast day, here's the key. It's not just what we call the moon turning into blood or a lunar eclipse. It's when it happens on feast days through history, something significant happens somewhere within 12 months to 48 months to the Jewish people. Uh, you can, you've had, for example, you've had um, a series of uh, lunar eclipses that have happened in the spring feast and the fall feast uh, on specific feast days about seven uh, times throughout history. And every time it relates either to, to the city of Jerusalem, it relates to the time Columbus discovered America, it, it relates to a time, a uh, prophetic time. Really now, significant Very time. significant. And, and, and I, I wanted to write this down to get him exact for those of you that are watching. The, the next ones that are coming up that are on feast days will be the, uh, the first day of Passover, April 15th, 2014. The first day of Tabernacles, April 8th, 2014. Now, this is a full lunar eclipse. Then the first day of Passover, April 4th, uh, 2015. The first day of Tabernacles, September 28th, 2015. Now, from, again, a rabbinical perspective, and a lot of the Jewish people watching us have rabbis that can verify this, the uh, blood moons are a bad sign for Israel. 
they're considered an omen of trouble for Israel. Now, you cannot look at these and say what's going to happen because none of us know. I can't do that. But we do know that on feast days, it doesn't matter if it happens, you know, in January or February, but when it falls specifically on a feast day, something significant happens either with the Jewish people or with Israel. And the sad thing is it's not always good. So that is when, when, when the book of Joel and the book of Acts, Joel 2 and Acts 2 says, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh, most scholars interpret the great and terrible day of the Lord as being the days of tribulation. So these are blood moons to happen before the tribulation period. And we're, of course, we're not in the tribulation period yet, of course, according to what I can see, because, uh, you know, prophetically. Well, I, I see this 80,000 hours of research understanding the Hebraic roots. You see, it didn't have to be explained in the New Covenant, and in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament. It, everyone understood these things. Perry, would you understand where we are prophetically? What's going on prophetically if you had never studied the Hebraic roots? It's totally impossible. Now, we found that these feast days that are called God's feasts are virtually ignored by the church, but they're not ignored by the devil. He picks feast days to attack Israel. Explain, Perry Stone. If you go into the New Testament, um, and you know, this is some research that we did, I found it very intriguing that, for example, when Satan would come after Jesus, he would usually come after him with a large crowd of people who didn't like him on Passover in Jerusalem. He, in the book of Acts, for example, during Passover, who was beheaded? James was beheaded and Peter was going to be beheaded after Passover. So then you had one apostle being killed before Passover, another one being attempted to be killed right after Passover. And I start realizing when you look at the the New Testament up into the book of Acts, there's probably six to eight examples what you can show you where the worst attack to come against Christ or against the apostles happened during the time of the feast. Now, I believe there's several reasons for that. Number one, Jerusalem was the site of redemption. And I'm going to give you a nugget here that's very powerful that the Lord gave me, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper, saw it yesterday. The reason Satan wants Jerusalem is he wants to own the site of redemption. Hmm. He wants to own the land where redemption took place and lay hold of it and claim it for himself. And he's not going to be able to do that, but he's going to make an attempt to. And if you will discover, uh, if you will look at these times when he would attack Christ during feast days, it was usually around Jerusalem or it was a time of a feast because, number one, it would be the site of redemption and was the site of redemption in the book of Acts. Number two, the largest crowds of people were there, which meant that if the Pharisees wanted to start a rumor on Christ, they had more people that could spread the rumor. Mm -hmm. than they had any other time during a feast day. So when you look at this, you come to the conclusion after you study these examples in detail, which I have, that the enemy understands the feast days. Why did Israel get attacked during Yom Kippur years ago? The Yom Kippur War, when the Syrians came in to attack Israel, was during the time when all the Jewish men were on a fast and they were in the synagogue. Right. Why, why Yom Kippur? So in other words, we have to understand that if Satan sees these feasts as significant, Surely we better understand what they represent. Well, not only understand what they represent, because God says these are my feasts. And in the Hebrew, the word for feast is these are my appointments. And many have found that when you worship God on his feast, there's like a portal, a, an amazing portal to heaven where the glory of God can come upon you and the angels can come up and down mm -hmm. the ladder. I mean, the devil knows why he attacks yes, us, absolutely. but Christians must know right. why not you have to. You don't have to come into the presence of God. You get to. That's right. You see the difference? Tell me a little bit about what you've gleaned on the second coming from the feast. Well, one of the things that I love to do, first of all, is to show people that in the seven feasts, there were three that all men had to attend. Passover, Pentecost, mm -hmm. and Tabernacles. Now, watch how significant this is. Passover, the emphasis there is the blood of the Lamb. That's your redemption. No one can be saved for you. You have to present yourself to the Lord for your salvation. Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, and that's the Holy Spirit baptism. So when you are to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, nobody can come on your behalf. 
You have to present yourself to the Lord. The third is tabernacles, which in the early church was a picture of the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the resurrection of the dead and the reign of the Messiah. Nobody can be resurrected for you. You're going to have to appear before the Lord and be resurrected yourself. Now, how interesting that out of these seven, the Lord chose number one, number four, and number seven, each representing something you have to personally do to enjoy the pattern of that celebration. Salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and the rule and reign of Christ through a resurrected body. And you have to be there. No one can do it for you. You must appear before the Lord, and it's you and Him alone during those three. What about what's known as the millennium? Yeah. Uh, give me a little insight in that. Well, if you remember at the Mount of Transfiguration, you had Christ and you had Moses and Elijah, and they were transfigured before the disciples. You know, Peter was so excited, and this, this, uh, this appears to have fallen during the Feast of Tabernacles because Peter said, let us build three tabernacles, but actually it's let us build three booths. And, you know, tabernacles is when the Jews build a, build a booth out of different uh, leaves right. and, you know, things, and they live outside. So this, because of what Peter said about let us build three tabernacles or three booths, uh, that transfiguration is a picture of the kingdom which is coming in the future. So in the millennial reign, what happens is this. You know, tabernacles is the one feast that Jews and Gentiles both come together. Even in Israel, it's a huge celebration. They celebrate together almost like one family. And so the, here's the pattern. Jesus is crucified at Passover in the grave, in the, in the tomb at unleavened bread, seen alive, at, alive by His disciples at first fruits. Then the church is born on Pentecost. And we are still, if I can say this, we are still prophetically living at Pentecost. We're living in the church age. We're living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit right now. But we're coming to trumpets. Trumpets is a picture of the gather, catching away, the gathering together of the saints, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Following the catching away, there comes the tribulation, which is the day of atonement, because atonement follows trumpets 10 days later, and it's the time when Israel was judged by the Lord, either mm -hmm. they were released or they were judged, depending on their spiritual condition. But after the tribulation ends, we come to the millennial reign in Revelation chapter 20, and the millennial reign of Christ is a thousand year reign, and that's pictured by Feast of Tabernacles uh, when we're, we're with Him. And really, Tabernacles, as you know, Sid, is the seasons of our joy and seasons of rejoicing. It's the last feast to introduce the rain, praying for the coming harvest, praying for the rain season to come. The Feast of our joy. Absolutely. I it mean, was a how would you time. like to celebrate an appointment with God with supernatural joy? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you know? Well, one of the things that I find is amazing is many Muslims mm -hmm. are having dreams and visions of God. And you said we're at Pentecost right now, which talks about dreams and Absolutely. visions of God. And, and uh, I will confer that to you. We have been contacted by individuals who have been Muslims who simply got hunger for God, got hungry to say there must be something more. And the odd thing is, if you're a Muslim and you're watching, God will visit you, Jesus will visit you in a dream. It's happened by the thousands. And see, it's happening more and more. We get emails constantly from Persians and Iraqis and people in Egypt, and all they do is pray. And they say, Lord, if you're real, show me. And the amazing thing is, I'm telling you, he, G, Christ is appearing to them, literally appearing to them and telling them who He is. But not just Muslims, but Jews. Yes. Orthodox Jews are having dreams and visions. But Perry, can you picture the training an Orthodox Jewish rabbi has, then has the revelation of what <laughs> the old revelation of, rather than two messiahs, Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David, one messiah, two appearances, and then becomes a oh. teacher? Sid Roth promoting one crackpot after another as if being Jewish makes you qualified. Well, there are some very qualified Jewish Bible expositors and some excellent Messianic Jewish scholars, but they're not the hyper-Messianic lunatic fringe that hog the limelight that Sid Roth promotes. As much as I like Jonathan Kahn personally, what is he doing? He's taking Pesha interpretations and applying it to American politicians like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. This is lunacy. This is not a proper use of Midrash. This is not authentic pressure interpretation.
this mystery of the kings, amazing. I'm telling you, it's been an amazing. I, I think Incredible. you're. I think it's the best you've ever. Brilliant. Done. Brilliant. I think it's. I, I, it's so now. It's now stuff. Be real now. Well, we we want to get going. We want to go to the mystery of the king. What's next? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now let me just. You'll get. You get sick of me saying this, but I want to say it every time we're on yes. here. Yes. Is that. <clears throat> this is a template like the harbinger. It's that God is showing something here yes. that explains what has been, what is, and what is to come. Yeah. And, he, and the, with the template, it involves people. Now, no person is our enemy. We must pray. Don't make somebody your enemy. We must pray for all people, including these people. They don't know what they're doing. Right. It's a sign of how they're, the dynamics of a fall of a nation they're, where they're playing the part. Okay. So here we are. We spoke about Ahab. Mm -hmm. We spoke about a king who was strategic but also weak, and he, he further did things no other king did in leading Israel away from God, particularly with the children with babies being killed under Baal and immorality. And then we had his wife Jezebel, who was a co-regent who was inciting him in many ways. And, but this is what we just saw. At the end of it, we saw Jezebel. But then we saw that Ahab, which most people don't realize, they just think of Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab his kingdom ends, his, his reign ends, but then Jezebel goes on after the end of his reign. So what, so what now happens? What happens to Jezebel? Here's the template. What happens to Jezebel? Her husband's reign comes to an end. Her career continues. Her ambition for power continues. Mm -hmm. She is, she, as it goes, she also, she dwells in the halls of power, influencing the nation behind the scenes, but still vying for power. What happened in America? Bill Clinton's reign comes to an end, but Hillary Clinton, according to the template, it goes on. She pursues her own political ambition. It was assumed, if you remember, every, it was almost like everybody knew that, even back then, that she was gonna run for president. They, that, there was a sense that she was ambitious and she wanted to become the ruler. Now in the template, Jezebel is no longer the queen. She is now the former queen. She's now the, she's not the first lady of Israel. She's the former first lady. And she is the, she is behind the scenes now. She's not the co-regent. Uh, she didn't have the same power she did when she went, when her husband was on the throne, but she still has power behind the scenes. She's influencing the king. According to the template of the mystery of the kings, the one who reigns now will be a man and he will be a younger man than the queen. So what, so that brings us to the next template and the next king. Now, after the end of Ahab's reign, the one who reigns are the sons of Ahab. The first one, Ahaziah, is cut off just as the reign begins. The central successor of Ahab is a king named Jehoram, King Jehoram. Some of your Bibles say Joram. The Bible says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Jehoram, for the most part, continues the evil of his father. Unlike Ahab, he, doesn't, he didn't pioneer the changes, but he continues the course of evil. He continues Israel's descent. In many ways, he takes up where Ahab leaves off. Barack Obama was the political son of the Clintons. And let me show you. First of all, his political career began under the reign of the Clintons. Began in, 19, in the 1990s, in the, in the same election that brought Bill Clinton back to power. 1996 brought Barack Obama to power for the first time. For the most part, he was unknown. He was, he was the, not, a regular, not a U.S. senator, he was a state senator in Illinois. Pretty much nobody knew him at all. And the, but it all changed in the Democratic Convention in the middle of, of in, 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 uh, in mm -hmm. the early 200, well, as it comes up, the same convention, interesting, that would nominate Kerry and John Edwards. Now, John Edwards, a few, right after the convention, is the one who would proclaim the harbinger scripture, Isaiah 9:10 mm -hmm. on 9-11. Right after that, he's the one who made that speech, the bricks have fallen. He made his entire speech centered on Isaiah 9:10. That same convention was the beginning of the rise of Barack Obama, if you remember it. Jehoram, he continued the ways of Ahab, not all of them, but he continued it. Barack Obama would continue where Clinton left off. In fact, in fact, in his first days of office, he did exactly what Bill Clinton did. He, he signed the executive order, swept away all the protections for abortion, expanded abortion around the world in just the first days of what That's exactly, the only, only president who did that was Clinton. So he signs the executive orders. Remember what the Clintons sought to do? They sought to nationalize health care. Obama begins where they left off. Jehoram was the, the son of Ahab. He's a political son of, of here, the Clintons. So they failed. He enacted health, he enacted 
the, the health, he nationalized health care and sought to get abortion in there. He even took Christian-owned companies to court to try to force them to pay for abortion, if you remember. Oh, this is what happened yeah. in this. That's so right. the Clinton administration was the first administration to seek to normalize homosexuality. The Obama administration took it to another level, pushing it to new extremes, breaking down the very definition of marriage, the overturning of marriage. And as did Ahab, Ahab moved Israel farther away from its biblical foundation, and so Jehoram did too. He, Obama was the first president in American history who said America is not or is not a Christian nation. That is exactly the template. Now, I saw something amazing in the first part was the exact days of Ahab. What about Barack Obama? When did Barack Obama's rise begin? When did he come on the national stage? Clearly, if there's no question, there's no debate about it. It clearly happened in the, with a Democratic convention. The, when was it? It was the summer of 2004. In November of 2004, he is elected to his first national office. January of 2005, he's sworn in in Washington at, as his first national position. It begins, when did his, his reign, when did his, when did his presidency end or come to an end? It came, the, the, the year that ended it was, November, was, was 2016 and the election of 2016. And then the final act was January, just happened, was Trump was the inauguration in January 2017. So what happens if you take the beginning of his rise, 2004, end of 2004, and then 2005, and go to the, to the end of his presidency? It brings you to 12 years. 12 years from 2004 to 2012, 12 years from 2005 to, to the inauguration, to both, both inaugurations goes there. All right, now, one other part of this, we just spoke about Jehoram, but there's another part of this. It wasn't just in the days of Jehoram, it wasn't just Jehoram who was in the royal palace. There was someone else with him. After the end of Ahab's reign, Jehoram was in the palace with Jezebel. She dwelt in the palace, not as the queen, but as the former queen, not as the co-regent, but as the counselor, as one influencing the king there. When America, what happened when Obama came into the White House, he didn't come alone. He brought in Hillary Clinton. And so now she it could never happen under a Republican administration, but it happened the first Democratic administration after her, the, after her husband's reign, she was back in the White House according, in the, according, on the throne, by the throne, not on it, by the throne, according to the template. And she is influencing things there. And, to, and now, according to the template, Jezebel is considerably older than the king, Jehoram. Well, now, now Hillary Clinton is considerably older than the president, and the president... Obama is considerably younger, just like Jehoram and Jezebel. Under, under Jehoram, Jezebel, and again, we have to pray for the people. They aren't the people, but they are in the template. Under Barack Obama, under this administration, America's apostasy continues in the areas of the unborn, just like with the worship of Baal, sexual immorality, God's order. And in 2011, Hillary Clinton tells, tells the nations of Africa that they all are going to have to change their standards concerning homosexuality, to impose it upon the world there. And as the, as the house of Ahab continues to usher in an age when, when believers are, are being attacked by the state, so more and more we've watched as believers are being attacked by the government, being boycotted, mocked, punished, fired, even put in jail in the same way. And then comes the election, as we bring it, of 2016, where we, as we get to where we've been. Hillary Clinton announces her candidacy for president. She is now all the more brazenly proclaiming abortion. Abortion from not only conception, but for the time, in effect, of birth. And now she's calling for the, for the striking down of the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment, remember, is the only thing that's protecting our money, tax money, going from paying for abortion directly so that your money, so that you're not paying for the killing of unborn children. Well, she is calling now, it's more brazen, for the striking down of that. And 11 days after she announces her candidacy, she goes to New York City and she makes a stunning statement. And here's what she says. She says, remember, deep-seated religious beliefs must be changed. <laughs> Why? so that abortion can increase. Now, I cannot imagine a more Jezebelian statement. What was Jezebel doing? And again, we pray for her, but what was Jezebel doing? 
It was to seek to change the deep-seated religious beliefs of Israel. Why? So Baal worship could increase, which involved the killing of babies. Never had a major candidate for the presidency ever spoken of changing people's belief in the word of God. In one statement, it's the most extreme thing ever, and it's being for religious liberty and for, and for babies. And had she, had, won, had she won, the Supreme Court would have been filled with those who would go along with it. Every single case for life, for religious liberty, for morality would have gone. And then comes the Democratic Convention. And they have the most brazenly anti-biblical platform in the history of America. And they also call for the striking down of the Hyde Amendment. As we mentioned earlier in the week, they all, for the first time, they're brazenly saying abortion. Before this, they wouldn't even, they would, they would try to kind of downplay it. But here, and at the same time, the Republican platform, here you're going to have a showdown now. The Republican platform was one of the most conservative platforms ever upholding life, religious liberty, Israel, morality. Two mm -hmm. visions, two futures, and many believers are preparing for days of persecution and a dark future as, and, and, and in the same way. And she is vying, and it looked like nobody could stop it because it seemed all the polls were saying the Democrats and their, the candidate the, would win, would win. But, but it was a very strange year this past year mm -hmm. with strange turn of events and a very different kind of man, <laughs> which brings us to the next template. President Obama, with all respect that is due, as you approach the last hour of the presidency, you were shocked by the outcome of the election, and now it appears that your legacy will largely be undone. You came to the presidency claiming as a Christian you could not support the ending of marriage as it had been known, and then you did everything in your power to end that very thing. And then you sought to force believers to take part in that very thing you said a believer could not take part in. If one believes that God is real, how can one do such things? You came to the president speaking of tolerance, and yet you showed no tolerance for the lives of the unborn. You zealously fought to defend the carrying out of their murder and expanded around the world. And you went farther. You sought to force God's people to fund their killing. President Obama, on the day when marriage as we know it, ordained by God, was with your help struck down in this land, you celebrated by lighting up the White House in the colors of the rainbow. Did you not know that the rainbow does not belong to man or to any movement? The rainbow belongs to God. It is the sacred sign of God's covenant and the sacred colors of his throne. If you believe that God is real, how can you use the sign of God to celebrate the striking down of the word of God? If you overturn the edicts of God, should you be surprised that your own edicts will be overturned? And if you strike down the precepts of God, will you not your own precepts be struck down? You launch accusations against the leader of Israel in a way you have never done to any leader of any enemy nation. You took part in isolating, condemning Israel before the world and advancing a resolution proclaiming Israel had no right to Jerusalem. If one has ever read the Bible, how could one foster such a thing? Did you miss what the word of God says concerning Jerusalem? There is only one who has authority over Jerusalem. And it is not the United Nations. It is not the European Union. It is not you. There is only one and his name is the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel. Long before there was a United Nations or United States or any of the nations that cast this vote, the Lord issued his own resolution concerning Jerusalem. And no law, no executive order, no UN vote will ever overturn it. And concerning that UN resolution, the Almighty has issued his own response. He vetoes it. 4,000 years ago, God made a covenant with Abraham that states, whatever you do to Israel shall be done to you. President Obama, you sought to intervene in an election held within the borders of a sovereign nation, Israel. Therefore, should you now be surprised if God intervenes in the election of your own nation? You sought through Israel's election to nullify the stands and legacy of its leader, Benjamin Netanyahu. So should you now be surprised if God intervenes now to nullify your own legacy? Despite how you treated the name of God, the word of God and the ways of God, the hand of God, this is the inconvenient truth. 
God is real. His word is true. His ways are eternal. His hand is mighty. His kingdom is without end, and the darkness shall not overcome it. Mr. President, I'm here to report to you good news. The God of Israel is alive and well, and his arm is strong to the rising up and casting down of kings and kingdoms and governments and administrations. If you don't think he can, to paraphrase your own words, yes, he can. Spoken at the inauguration. That was that was the hour of that was the hour of the inauguration. Yes, right. In, in, Trump ho in Trump Hotel, in yes. Trump's hotel, yes. in Washington D.C., the yes. presidential inaugural prayer breakfast hosted by Mary Turner. That you were there at the yes. beginning. Yeah. Are you ready for the next one? Yeah. Okay. Second Kings nine. Okay. The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, "Tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of olive oil with you, and go to Ramoth Gilead." When you get there, look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get away from his companion, get him away from his companions, take him to an inner room, take the flask, pour it, the oil on his head, and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. Don't delay. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander. He said, for which one of us, asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up, went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord God of Israel says, I anoint you, king over the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. I'll avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off Ahab every last male, and it goes on. Then he opened the door and ran. So the prophet Elijah is now going to do what Elijah was told to do, which is to anoint a man called Jehu. Who was Jehu? He was a leader, but he was not a politician. He was a soldier. He was a fighter. He was in Jehoram's camp. He was, even before that, he was of Ahab's camp. He served Ahab. Now Jehoram is in Jezreel. Elisha sends one of the prophets, young prophet, to anoint him to bring an end to the house of Ahab, to bring judgment that Elijah had prophesied to Ahab in Jezreel. The phenomenon of Donald Trump, it defied everybody's expectations. It came out of the blue. The key behind him, at least up to this point, and we've heard Cyrus and there's something there, but is the man called Jehu. Jehu is anointed to come head to head with Jezebel. It would come in the end down to Jezebel versus Jehu. The election of 2016 would come down to Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. At the time, Jezebel is older. She's a grandmother. So was Hillary Clinton. What about Jehu? What do we know? He's a leader. He's not a politician. He's a man of war. He's a man who gets into a lot of conflicts. <laughs> he's a man who, he's not a gentle man. He's a rough man. He mounts his chariot and heads to the royal city. And he heads there to do, it's a race to the throne. Like a race to the White House. He's racing... The lookout reports, he says, it's the lookout who's at, in Jezreel says, look, we see something coming. Who does it look like? He says, the driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Hmm. <laughs> but let me tell you, it's even more than that. Yes, the race, the race to the throne by Jehu was furious. But, it's even, but the Hebrew is even more amazing because the, the word in Hebrew is shugah, which means crazy. <laughs> Donald Trump's race to the throne was crazy. Yeah. It also means insane and mad. I can't think of a better word to describe this campaign and this and the last thing. Jehu drives the chariot crazily to the White House. Well, well I'm sorry. <laughs> Trump did. But nevertheless, even though it was crazy, Jehu gets there. And the same with Trump. Even though it was crazy, he gets there. And at the same time... You know, listen, if I tell you, I'm not going to read all this, but it's amazing when I read the commentaries, this is what commentaries, old comment, pulpit commentary, all the 19th century, 20th century commentaries, not me, commentary, say about Jehu. He was ruthless, he was, but he was chosen by God. He was tenacious, he was furious, he would have occasional bursts of fury, it says, <laughs> almost fanatical zeal. There was personal ambition, but he was also used by God. This is what the commentaries are saying. He was chosen. I don't even have to say anything here. I don't have to say. 
chosen to be used. God uses unlikely mm -hmm. vessels. Even he can use those who don't know him as well. And he uses those who... Can we all be okay. in it, do you think? Well, let me show you something. Well, we're kind of in it. I believe you can meet it in two ways. But here, let me... Let me <laughs> okay. when we, and we get to the last part, which is the message to us. So let, but here, here, here this. This is, this okay. is crazy. This is crazy. Okay. If I may use that word. It's in the yes. Bible. Okay. <laughs> okay. It sure is. Could it be that God's people are even in this template? And here it is. There's a man in the template called Jehanadab. Now, this is what it says. After Jehu left there, he's on his chariot ride. He's, he's bring, he came upon Jehanadab, son of Rechab, who was on his way to meet him. Now, who was Jehanadab? Jehanadab is the leader of a people called the Rechabites. The Rechabites are followers of God. They are against the corruption of Ahab and Jezebel. They keep themselves separate. They abstain from things. We read about them in Jeremiah, actually. Now, think about the believers, first of all, in America, mm -hmm. trying to keep themselves separate from all the, 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 the evil and the darkness, uh, uh, grieved and, trying to, and against this. Well, li the amazing thing, listen to the, what the commentaries say about Jehonadab. Okay. They call him a member of, they call him a religious conservative. Uh, wow. Literally. You'll see, they call him a member of a conservative sect. They call him a religious conservative. Religi he's representing the religious conservatives. Okay? Now, and here, here's what, here's what uh, one of the commentaries says. Elisha and Jehanadab appear to have stood morally apart from their generation. The days were evil, and he was not at home in them. He was surrounded by the favored nation of God, but they had sunk, as God said they would, to the level of the nations among whom they dwelt. Now, here's another commentary here. When Jehu appeared like a re great revivalist in the midst of evil, commissioned by God to punish Israel for their sin, Jehonadab may have thought, here comes the change I have longed for. Think of the religious conservatives and Donald Trump. <laughs> now the worship of Jehovah will prosper. Now the people will learn God's ways. The revolt of Jehu, now here's another commentary. This is not me, this commentary. The revolt of Jehu was not only politically inspired, behind him was the conservative faction <laughs> led by Jehonadab. Accordingly, here, here's another one from a commentary. Accordingly, Jehonadab was extremely interested in Jehu's reputed desire to purge the nation from its heathenism. Perhaps he hoped that in Jehu a sense of national repentance and longing for the God of Israel would now take place. My good, how can you be any more exact? My goodness. They were firm, and here's a, they were, they were, they were conservative, religious conservative. Now you remember this year, and you remember, well, there were crucial meetings between Donald Trump and the religious conservatives, leaders. Remember that? And now look what happens at the template. Jehu greets Jehonadab and says, are you in accord with me as I am with you? In other words, I'm with you people. Are you going to be with me? Does that sound like this year? It sure does. I am, said Jehonadab. So the religious conservatives say yes. If so, said Jehu, give me your hand. So he did. And Jehu helped him up into the chariot. Jehu said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Then he had him ride in the chariot. Hmm. Now think about this. You know, now now the way Je the way Jehu drove, it was a crazy race. <laughs> but the conservatives, I'd say, well, am I going to go in this chariot? I'm not going to go in this chariot. Yeah. <laughs> Back and forth. It's exactly. I mean, God also has a sense of humor too here. Oh yeah. But they believed that the greater good. They were concerned. You know, you could see there's concern. You, there's a, you, you, it's implied that John is concerned about Jehu. What's his motives? What's and that's in the commentaries. What's going on? You know what? You know is it is it is it really for the Lord and all that? But but Jehonadab, he the ultimate thing is that. They see the evil coming that if, that if this continues, if things continue under Jezebel and under Jehoram, it's gonna, it's, it's a, it's gonna, it's, we're gonna, we're gonna be finished. So he goes with him and he goes through and, and so on now the, and now something else. What's this? Interesting. Jehonadab doesn't join Jehu at the beginning of his race, only towards the end to the latter part. Most of the religious conservatives did not join Donald Trump until the end, the latter part of the race. That's right. Just like in here. And so they're riding together to the capital city, <laughs> to the capital city. Maybe. So what happens now? What happens? Jehu comes to Jezreel. King Jehoram is there in the chariot. And it says Jehoram, Jehoram gets, takes the chariot, goes out to Jehu. He says, Are you, have you come in peace? Jehu answers, how can there be peace as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? Notice they meet up in Jezreel at the same place where Elijah prophesied to Ahab, where Ahab and Jezebel committed their sin and killed this innocent man. 
and his family. So there, that's where Elijah said, well, God is going to end your house, and now it's coming true. It was delayed. Remember, it was delayed. Ahab, Ahab asked for mercy. It was delayed until now. And so here's what, so it all goes back to the sins of the house of Ahab here. Now, so here it comes. And now notice something. Even though Jehu is confronting Jehoram, he, his real fight is with Jezebel. He says, how can I, Jehoram, be, as long as Jezebel's there? So in the midst of, this, of this, this showdown this year, it was, again, Jehu and Jezebel. And notice something. He confronts, you know, Jehu is confronting Jezebel and Ahab over their sins. It's all about that. What did Donald Trump do on national television? He confronted the Clintons over, not, he confronted over the killing of the unborn, the sin of Ahab and Jezebel, the killing of babies. And, and, and Hillary Clinton defended it on television, if you remember that. That's right. I remember. And not only that, not only that, what else did, what else did he, uh, you know, Donald Trump also started speaking, he started speaking about the sins of Bill Clinton, you know, which is what Jehu <laughs> does here. Jehu, because what happens is, Jehu now brings an end to the reign of Jehoram. And, he, and, he, and then he says something very interesting. He says, he says to his, his charioteer, his, his guy, he says, don't you remember when we were right by Ahab? Because he served under Ahab. And he says, don't you remember when the prophet Elijah prophesied on the same ground that this would come for the sins of Ahab? And so here he's reminding of the sins, which is what Donald Trump did too. Notice something else, even this. Jehu was originally, he was not against Ahab and Jezebel. He was originally for Baal. He was defending. He was their person. He was the commander of Jehoram and undoubtedly of Ahab. He was right by Ahab. So originally, Donald Trump was not against abortion. He was for abortion. That's right. But then he turned. Yes, he did. Jehu was originally defending the kingdom of Baal, and now he's going to overturn the kingdom of Baal. Wow. Just like in the temple. Wow, 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 wow. And so, Incredible. so he makes his way now. Jehu makes his way to Jezebel. Jezebel comes out on the balcony, famous scene. She puts on makeup and all this stuff and taunts and sarcastically says, have you come here? He says, you, you, you murderer, you, you, you Zimri. Calls him by the guy who, overthrown, who overthrew the other one who only lasted seven days. So he's, she's taunting him. And that's when he calls for her judgment and her downfall. Famous thing, everybody knows it. Je the end of Jezebel's reign. So think about something now. By ending, by Jezebel's reign, by Jezebel being defeated, that means that Jehoram's legacy is overturned. Because if Jezebel <laughs> continued, even though Jehoram, and if the other children of, a, the other sons and heirs of Ahab continued, which Jehab would judge, then the legacy of Ahab and Jezebel and Jehoram would have continued. But because, because Jezebel is out of the picture of, the, of this defeated in here, then the legacy of Jehoram comes to an end. Jehu will now end, so Jehu, so Trump will, by the defeat of the Democratic candidate, Obama's legacy was overturned. Yeah. Now, and he immediately started undoing executive order. Now, not all, not all of it has been overturned, and I want, there's an amazing, amazing word for here of caution, an amazing prophetic word for us here, which I'll get to, but here, so here that happens, and who, and what does Jehu do after that? Then Jehu becomes the next king. You have Jeho after Jehoram, Obama, you have Jehu, Trump. He becomes the next king. He assumes the kingship. Now let me tell you one more thing as we bring this home. Okay, one more thing. There's a template called the template of the 12th year. And that is this. When does all this take place? When does Jehu rise up? When does the, the chariots come? When does Jehoram's reign end? When does Jezebel, when does all this happen? It all happens in the 12th year of Jehoram. It all happens. Well, what did we see before? If you look at the beginning of Jehoram, you look at his rise, 2004, five, go fast forward 12 years. It takes everything to the year 2016 and then January, 2017. That is the year when all these things happen. When Jehu rises up, Jehu defeats Jezebel. When Jehoram's reign ends, all these things. So it would put us in this exact period when it all took place. The exact timing. But something else. Something else happened amazing. Around the world, if you remember, the world in Syria, they're actually standing. There's not many. I don't know if there, how much there exists this in the world. But there is one place in the world. There is one there was, a temp there was a temple of Baal that was standing across the world. 
actually more than once, standing in the Syrian city of Palmyra. It was standing for almost 2,000 years. Okay, but in the summer of 2015, the temple of Baal was destroyed. Now, a gigantic event it was destroyed. And that's actually linked to the harbinger of that arch, that uh, veil that appeared in America. But we won't even go into that now. Right. But wow. this is gigantic. Now think about something. When Jehu rose up in that year, when Jehu rose up in the 12th year, something specifically happened. He, what happened was the temple of Baal was destroyed. Mm. He was the destroyer of the temple of Baal. And in the same year of his rise, of Trump's rise, the temple of Baal was destroyed. Wow. That is gigantic. The same, I mean, after two that is gigantic. Wow. Now, huge. Now, <laughs> huge. That's powerful. Huh. And there's more. I'm, I can only do Shaking. so. Shaking. Um, ah. But now, let, me, let me bring it home. Okay, mm. let me, now, even the Bible commentaries have a hard time with Jehu because he's such a different figure. He's controversial. They don't know what to make of him. Even the Bible commentaries to this day. Mm -hmm. And they say things like, you know, but the fact is whatever one thinks of Donald Trump, he was used against all odds, to stop an agenda that would lead to the encroachment of religious liberty, mm -hmm. the indoctrination of our children, the end of really religious freedom, the persecution of God's people. What did, what, did, what did Jehu's victory mean? It meant there was a reprieve in Israel, right? It meant that the persecution, the state stopped, stopped for a time. It meant that the worship of Baal was going to stop for a time, at least as a state thing. The, the, the killing of babies, he, he was, he was, that Jehu undoes that. We'll see what happens here. And that's all part of what's happening here. We'll see what happens. We've got to pray. But the thing is that no person is the answer. You know, of course. And again, we share this very important. The election is not the answer. The election is a window for the answer. Mm -hmm. The answer is, has to do with us and God. So Jehu, what happened? What's the, what's the, Jehu did end the state worship of Baal. But here's the warning. We have to pray. Mm -hmm. It says he didn't depart from the ways of Jeroboam. So we have to pray. Now here, let me say this. We have to pray because some things have been overturned already. Amazing. In the first, the first weeks of, the first days of, of Trump, he, 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 with abortion, he did it right away. But then there have been other things on some issues where we have to pray about. Okay. So the answer is not, the answer is this is a window. Mm -hmm. This is a window. And part of it, it was a window for revival. That's what, is what we're talking about. And that's why we're giving the warning. And giving the warning that if we don't make use of this, yeah. then, then, and what happens, you know, the, here the commentaries say, we mu here, this is what commentaries say about Jehu. Jehu is exactly one of those men whom we are compelled to recognize, commentary, not for what is good or great in themselves, but as instruments for destroying evil and preparing the way for good. The way for good is revival. The way for good is revival. And, and the last word that I'll have in a second, but, but if we can, I believe it's, we have a short clip of, I think it's about a minute, of words to Trump that was at the, from that same inaugural prayer breakfast on the day of his inauguration. You are about to become the most powerful man on earth. Remember always that it is the Almighty who lifts up kings to the throne. It is the Almighty who removes them. Your authority comes not from man, but from God, the King above all kings. Therefore, submit your life to his authority, and by his authority you shall lead. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Your life has been a vessel of your will. Now it must become a vessel of his will and his purposes. Walk in his footsteps. Walk, seek his righteousness. Follow the leading of his voice. Uphold his ways, and you shall be upheld. Keep his word, and you shall be kept. Give honor to his name above all names, and your name shall be honored. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you will arise and you will shine, and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. Yes. Oh, Lord, we pray that. We pray that for our president. Yes, that's awesome. We have to pray. Yes. We have to pray. That's what it's about. Yes. And here's the last part for now, and that is this. Uh, you know, there's one more piece of the puzzle that I didn't touch, and that is crucial for us. Before all these things played out that in this last year, the Lord opened the door for me to speak, as you said you were talking, Lori, where the Lord opened the door on Capitol Hill. Yeah. And I spoke to leaders and members of Congress by God's grace. And that time I was led specifically to speak about Baal and God and Elijah and America at the crossroads between God and Baal. Remember that? I mean, that, that, was, that was just led. I didn't, now, I didn't realize it here 
But that was right, that was the, the day before, well, this part I realized, the day before I said that, the Supreme Court heard the case that would decide marriage. A few days before that, Hillary Clinton made that statement, right. deep-seated religious beliefs must be changed. And then a few days before she ran for it, and then all these things happened. But the, the, what is the missing, the missing factor here is Elijah. And the, these are to be, if these are the days of Baal and Ahab, what this is telling us, Ahab, Baal, Jehoram, Jezebel, then these must also be the days of Elijah. Yes. And who is Elijah? Where's Eli Where do we find Elijah? Elijah is to be us. Elijah is to be you. Elijah, we are to be the Elijahs. That's what it's telling us. This is our part of the template now. Elijah, and this is the revelation, that the time of wavering is over, the time of being a gray Christian is over, the time of compromise is over, the time of, 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 of making deals with the darkness is over. The revelation is these are the, di the days of Elijah. We must become the Elijahs of the day. Amen. And that is, and that means, this is our template, that means that if we will take up the mantle of Elijah, now Elisha did it, he, he, he wasn't anything, but he took it up, and God, if we will take up the mantle of Elijah, God will anoint us with authority, with boldness. We are to now live in the power of his might. This is our day. This is our time. We were to be single-minded, unafraid, to stand up against the darkness. God is real. God wants us confident. He wants us with conviction. He wants us to go all out or don't go at all. Elijah wasn't back and forth. He was single-minded. He, he, he had his things, but he was single-minded. God wants us, and if we will do this right here, right now, he's asking, God is saying, where is my Elijah? Where are my Elijahs? If these are the Elijahs, then let us resolve, let us commit that we will once and for all become the Elijahs of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yes, we need to go back and understand the Hebrew root. The term is Riza in Greek. Root, not Hebrew roots. Hebrew roots is nonsense. It is Hebrew root. It's a singular term in the Greek language of Romans chapter 11. It has to do with God's covenant relationship with the patriarchs of Israel. Yes, we must go back and interpret the scriptures the way the early Christian church did with the Judeo-Christian hermeneutic. That is true. But what's happening today is Gnosticism, is lunacy. Most of the Messianic movement is taken over by a lunatic fringe that lifts up Jewishness instead of Jesusness and mixes hyper-charismatic charismania, neo-Montanism, it mixes that with Yiddishkeit, diasporic Ashkenazi Jewish culture that seeks to put even Gentiles under the law. Now, I think all believers, even believers who are Gentile, need to understand the theology and the typology and the doctrinal importance and the prophetic meaning of the Hebrew feasts. But you don't need to observe them if you're not Jewish especially. Our Passover as believers, we are told, is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is the Lord's Supper. Now, I'm not opposed to Jewish believers observing these things. My family are Jews. We always had Purim. We always have Passover and Hanukkah in a Christocentric way. But again, this craziness that's overtaken the Messianic movement and people putting people on pedestals just because they're Jewish, and they're ignoring the real Jews who know what they're talking about. If you want to read Jewish scholars, begin with Alfred Edersheim and David Barron. Work your way forward to Arnold Fruchtenbaum, to Michael Rydelnik, to Daryl Bach, to Conrad Gempf. Read the real thing. People running around calling themselves rabbis who know nothing about rabbinics. You talk to them about the Shulhan Aruch, they don't have a clue. Most of them don't even speak Hebrew. And it's getting crazier. As soon as God works among the Jews, Satan gets coots. And now, another false pronouncement of the parousia, the return of the Lord. What Satan achieves through the Y2K crackpots, through the Harold Camping crackpots, through the Mark Built Blood Moon crackpots, and now through the September 23rd Virgo crackpots, is that when things of actual prophetic significance take place, things that are important, 
They take their eyes off the ball. They look at the nonsense instead of what the scripture says to look at. Just this past week, Turkey announced it is purchasing S-400 anti-aircraft and anti-ballistic missile systems from Russia. NATO member Turkey has signed an estimated billion dollar deal to buy Russia's advanced S-400 missile system. The S-400 missile system deal has already been signed by officials. As far as I know, the first installment was also transferred. This process will continue between Turkey and Russia. Well, the delivery of this particular system, it's a Russian S-400 system, which is surface-to-air missiles. And what we're looking at here is the first installment, the first payment on a deal that we estimate is worth around 2.5 billion US dollars. And Russia's new system is the next generation air defense system. And we're looking at a range of targets, aerial targets, ranging from aircraft and also non-manned aircraft, drones, and also varying types of missiles. And to take those targets down, we're looking at a system System that deploys three different types of missiles. This new system is apparently twice as good as the old one. So let's look at further at some of the capabilities of this particular system. It can engage up to 80 targets all at the same time. It has a maximum target range of 400 kilometers and a maximum target speed of 4.8 kilometers per second. So powerful stuff. We're looking in terms of those who've bought it, as we say, we're talking about the Turkey deal. China have already requested it. And also it looks like India are, they're, they're interested in this particular deal as well and it's also been deployed in Syria so that, that's the particular deal that's what the, the system can do but also what are the wider implications well as we know Turkey is a member of NATO it has the second largest army amongst the allies there and Washington has already voiced some concerns there have been some some worrying murmurs from the Pentagon about this deal going forward which have now of course it's gone through and in the meantime there have been a decline in relations between Ankara and Washington whereas at the same time we've seen an improvement between Ankara and Moscow. Also at the same time when Pe President Erdogan announced this particular deal he said that all the differences with Russia are all in the past and particularly any controversies that they might have had while in their dealings about Syria. A strategic rapprochement between Russia and Turkey. If there is going to be a Gog and Magog scenario from Ezekiel 38 and 39 apart from and prior to the post-millennial one of the book of Revelation, what could be more important than Russia and Turkey forging strategic links? But are people talking about that? No! They're instead talking about Virgo. Revelation chapter 12, as we've said, is one of the most important passages in understanding the return of Christ. It is a pressure interpretation of Matthew's nativity narrative, where the dragon of Revelation 12 recapitulates the actions of Herod the Great and foreshadows the Antichrist. It comes directly from the book of Daniel chapter 7, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, etc. It's there. It's right there. He sweeps a third of the stars from heaven, just as in Daniel chapter 8, the Antichrist will knock the stars out of the sky. These things are very important. But instead of handling it in an exegetically responsible manner, a hermeneutically responsible manner, we get crackpot idiocy, nonsense. Perry Stone, you are a disgrace. You want to serve Christ? Get off the internet and get out of the ministry. But you've done the cause of Christ Nothing but harm with your crackpot nonsense. William Papley, go with them. You've done enough harm. You're the boys who cried wolf. When the real thing happens, the world won't listen. All you're good for is getting believers to take their eyes off the ball. As Paul said in Timothy, you are deceived yourselves and you are being used by Satan to deceive others. Instead of looking at and concentrating on what we need to concentrate on, and instead of having credibility with the world, you are discrediting us with your prophecies that don't happen. I've said this 10,000 times, and I wish I were not saying it again. In the words of Moshe Rabbeinu, in the words of the Lord spoke through Moshe, but if a prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. 
you may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. In other words, do not read World Net Daily anymore. In other words, do not pay any attention to people like Perry Stone or William Tapley or Mark Bills or these other crackpots who discredit the reputation of the body of Christ as a voice for truth in an hour of darkness. When the real things happen, people will not pay attention to us because we've been too discredited by these crackpots, these false teachers and false prophets half of whom are out to make a profit. They do it for money. September 23rd has come and it is gone. Gee, I had a big going away party. All for nothing. Here we are. This is not good. This is not from Jesus. It's a shame and a disgrace. It ought not be happening. It diverts people away from studying what we should be studying and the way we should be studying it. And it discredits the voice of the church to the world. It leads Christians astray. And it lines the pockets of scoundrels. This has got to stop, dear friends, but it isn't stopping. If anything, expect it to get worse before the Lord comes. What a mess. What a situation. Harold Camping, Mark Biltz, now it's William Papley, the Lord knows who else. Haven't we had enough? Isn't it time to just return to Jesus and let him teach us by his spirit? The time is getting short. The Lord is coming. Prophetic events are lining up with scripture. Am I wasting our time with these diversions? that are counterproductive to the cause of Christ? That mislead the church? No, Virgo. Revelation 12 is not about Virgo. And you're never gonna know what it's about if you keep listening to the people who said it is. I may sound angry. That's because I am angry. I'm angry at Satan for doing this to the body of Christ, and I'm angry at those Christians who allow Satan to use them. They are in the service of Satan. They are not in the service of Yeshua, of Jesus. Please, please, this must stop. We've got Jim Baker, a man with no biblical right whatsoever to be in the ministry. You must have a good reputation with those outside the church. Now, if the world lies about you, the Lord will vindicate you. But they don't have to lie about Jim Baker. All they have to do is tell the truth. Oh, but he repented. Then if he repented, he would accept the consequences of his actions and realize he does not meet the biblical criteria to be in ministry. He does not have a good reputation with those outside the church. He's disgraced the name of Christ and made born again a household joke along with his late former wife, who divorced him, Tammy. Sexual immorality, financial corruption, and heresy. That is his legacy. Now, if he repented, he wouldn't be in the ministry. If someone falls from grace the way he did, dragged out of court in handcuffs, crying for something for which he was guilty, Peter says, if you're going to be dragged away in handcuffs, let it be persecution for the name of Christ, not because you're a criminal. Do I believe in repentance and forgiveness? Yes. People like Jim Baker, if they really repent, can be restored to fellowship. They can be restored to fellowship. But no, they cannot be restored to leadership. They don't qualify anymore. If they really repented, they would accept that. So then they say, don't you believe in forgiveness? What about David? As I've said before, David was a king. He was not a high priest. 
He was from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi. He was not restored to ministry. He was restored to a political regal office, not to a priestly office as a member of the clergy. It is a false comparison. Moreover, that is the old covenant. We are under the new one, and the new covenant tells us you must have a good reputation. The world may lie about you. They're inevitably going to do that. But when all they have to do is tell the truth about you, these men like Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker have no right to be in ministry. None! But there's Jim Baker. Not only is he selling this stuff, he's capitalizing on it. He's marketing products to survive it. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this special message. We put together this family gathering bundle. Right. Okay? Yes. And it's only $450. Yes, sir. Right. And and so that is a year and four months. Yes, sir. That is a, a tremendous saving. Mm -hmm. And when you get this food, you get the fruit variety bucket. 199 serving. You get a vegetable variety bucket, 109 servings. You get the gluten free black bean bucket, 215 servings. You get the Fiesta bucket, 196. That's that's the whole Mexican bucket. Yes, sir. Right. And then we have the French toast kit, which was just developed it's last month. Right. And so it's a $925 value. So you're going to save $475. And then you get this bonus of two boxes of each flavor of Frontier Bites. Right. And uh, so there's macadamia, pineapple, coconut. Mm -hmm. There's pecan, cherry, cinnamon. There's almond, blueberry, lemon. Mm. And so you get uh, how many boxes of that now? Two of two. each flavor. This is a special, special product. Mm -hmm. That's only going to be for this special week. That's right. That's right. It's good. Okay. Now, you have the new meal extenders. Yes. This is a John Shorey thing. This meal extenders is 1,837 servings. That's good. That's a, that's this, there's almost two years of food. Right. So. right. And extenders, they're like, Put some water in the soup, Ma. <laughs> yes. Because we got company. That's right. Know, and that's what extenders are. Yes. And I, I think we ought to order one right now. I do too. This because is great. we've got lots of food stored away. Right. But when people drop in, right, they can eat a lot. Well, well, the extenders <laughs> are. Some you have to add extenders. some, that's some right. extenders like okay. lentil lentil bean bucket, which is three hundred and eighty six servings. I could sing the hallelujah chorus. Uh, I, love, <laughs> I know I love lentils. I'm a lentil fan. It's true. They give me energy. Yes. Can't you tell? Yes. Okay, pinto beans. My four hundred and thirty two yes. servings. Right. So then, what's the next one? White rice. Bucket. How many servings? 405. Then what is this vegetable stew mix? 388 servings. Yes. So then the potato slice bucket. Mm -hmm. So what can you do with a potato slice? Anything. Eat it. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, whatever you want to do. You can fry it up. You can boil it. You can add it to stew, soups, whatever you want to do. Okay, Maybe. so here we have the new meal extenders. These are extenders. Right. But, well, with the but, meal extender bundle, you also get a bonus yes. as well. You receive two boxes of each flavor of the Frontier Bites yes. that we all love so much. And that's macadamia pineapple coconut, pecan cherry cinnamon, almond blueberry lemon, and they are wonderful. There are only eight ingredients in so these. You're getting things. one year, eight months of food, mm -hmm. Sue, for $550. And you're getting this set of uh, two boxes of. And six each, pouches. Oh, two boxes of each flavor each Frontier box. Bites. So call 1 888 988 1588 or write us today at P.O. Box. 7330 Branson, Missouri, 65615, or go to the website, jimbakershow.com. Our birthday, our anniversary. 56 years. 56 years mm -hmm. of, as my anniversary of, of preaching yes. the gospel. Yes. So I've been preaching for 56 years. And, and it's always on the 4th of July. 
Food for Health and the folks that do develop this generating system, which is totally the greatest system in the world. And uh, they call it the Independence Day Complete Generator Special. And the great thing about these deals is that there's financing available. But uh, we have the $4,200 total unit. And that, of course, includes generator one and generator two. This is the auxiliary unit. It connects together with this amazing, huge cord. Look at that heavy duty. That is what connects these two units. This is over 300 times more powerful than our last unit was. So what we're going to do today, just for the next few days, during the, from now to the 4th of July celebration that week, we're going to give you a couple bonuses. So if you want the huge, this is the biggest generator that's, that we know of, of its kind, that you can buy, but it charges with these solar panels. You can literally keep your refrigerator running a few hours a day to keep your food from spoiling. And it can run most wash machines now. With this double power, it can do so many things. And it's triple power, Pastor. We went from 600 watt hours to adding 1,200 more. So it's a total of 1,800. So it's actually, like you said, 300% yeah. or three times more run times. Yeah. We have the base unit, yes. which you can get for $2,000. And that's just this unit here. With the base unit of $2,000, you get a panel. Yes. You get this unit, yes. and you can run power stuff. You can run all kinds of stuff. Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, if you get this unit for $2,000, this is the base unit right there. You get that. You get the cord that goes to it, solar panel. Yes. You get the solar panel. But then it's only this special time at the 4th of July week and all during up to the 4th of July week, you will get the bonus of a case of black bean burger yes sir in those yes, last sir. 25 years oh absolutely you get what else we've got a second solar panel in today so you're getting two yes, solar sir. panels yes sir and finally we've got this 1000 lumen tactical flashlight that's a high power that's yes. a retail 80 dollars flashlight it is. that it comes is. with it i wish everybody could have one of these i have one now at my house and i love having it this is 300 times more powerful than anything we've ever offered before. The complete generator. The complete yes. set, $4,200. You get everything on this table. You also get two solar panels instead right. of one. That's right. With the two panels, you can charge this up. It'll actually go to three panels. And we can actually add a fourth panel, Pastor. Yes, sir. You're kidding. Yeah, but you can daisy chain them all together, four panels in a row. So, but you got, you double right now yeah, you, the sun power. Yes. So it charges twice as fast, basically, that's, that's exactly than, right. than one panel. So you get today, for our birthday celebration, you're going to get two panels with it. And you can get financing for this, too. And you get a bean burger, burger yes. box. Yes, sir. But now I get to give you yes. the crank. Yes. And this is so if the sun's not shining, it's raining outside, you can crank and make electricity by hand mm -hmm. and in the case yes. of, a, of an emergency. Easy. It okay. really is. Yes. And then you get this amazing machine right here. This, you can cook with this. Absolutely. Yeah, that's our 600-watt microwave, Pastor Jim, and that, that works extremely well. It works with this machine. But, Pastor Jim, I do want to let you know that there's only 200 of those in, so that the first 200 people that they call, call right now, they can get that. If the first 200 bonus. people get, a gen, get this special microwave yes, as well okay yes, and then the flashlight comes with this unit yes, too yes sir you get the case for the yeah. for the generator the emp bag yes sir anybody who has generators at home and doesn't have this 12 volt blanket they need that 12 volt blanket that is a must especially if you live where it's cold and then the led light that's uh, those are these these are little three watt light bulbs there's a three light stringer we call them I call them three light stringer but they're all individually controlled with this little switch right here so you can have them all or you can have none yeah so there's there's three of the lights yes sir which retails for eighty dollars yes sir yes 
So we have the 12 volt electric blanket. We have the three light kit, the LED lights. We have the EMP bag, generation three. We have 25 foot extension cord to the solar panel. We have the new and improved uh, carry cart. Yes, you, back here, yes. And you're saving 3386 You're giving $3,386 value bonuses in, yes. in this offer right now. Yes. This is the best bundle I'm, I'm aware of that, that we've ever done. So it's $4,200 for this amazing power and to have electricity to never be in the dark. So call 1-888-988-1588 or go to the website, jimbakershow.com. Nothing but what he's always been, a religious con artist. Jonathan Kahn, what is wrong with you? Why are you involved with someone like him? And all the people are sitting there clapping. If you clap for Jim Baker, you'll clap for the Antichrist and false prophet. You're already deluded. The Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. We all have our faults. We all have our problems. But when you publicly disgrace the name of the Lord, you no longer qualify for ministry. Certainly not for leadership. But there they are. Business as usual. They are in business. They're not in ministry. They're in business. That's all it is. A religious enterprise. But they're not building the kingdom of God. They are not preparing the way for the return of Yeshua. In fact, they are muddling up the waters. They're doing the work of the enemy. Not the work of the Lord. Why will Joseph Farah, a man who I personally like and respect, did one time I had a tremendously high view of Joe Farah, why is World Net Daily promoting these crackpots? Is it only about business? Jonathan, please, I plead with you, why are you involved with Jim Baker and engaging in these crazy hermeneutics, this misuse of Pesher? It's not even real Pesher. You want to know what Pesher is? I'll explain how Pesher works. I'll sit down with you and show you. But it's not what you're doing. People who will put people on a stage just because they're Jews. If there's one Jew and one Jew only who belongs on a stage, it's Jesus, Yeshua. We're all co-equal in Christ. Now, yes, to the Jews belongs the oracles of God. They're the natural branches. And praise God, they're being grafted in again. But listen to the valid Jewish scholars. Please, read Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Read Daryl Bach. Read Michael Rydelnik. Read Alfred Edersheim. Read David Barron. Read Conrad Gemp. Read Jewish scholars who are worth reading. I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not saying I always agree with them or they with me, but their basic doctrine is right, and I at least know what they're doing and what they're talking about. And they're not false teachers or false prophets. Most people are not going to pay any heed to this caveat. They're just going to see somebody who's angry, circumventing the reason why I am angry. That I'm angry at the devil and I'm angry at those in the body of Christ who should know better and who do know better, but allow themselves to be used by the devil to do his work. This is bad, but there will be some. There will be some who drank this Kool-Aid. And my prayer is after hearing this message or similar messages from others saying similar things, you'll stick your fingers down your throat like a bulimic and vomit that poison Kool-Aid out before it's too late. Because if you've been paying attention to Harold Camping, or Mark Biltz, or Jim Baker, if you've been paying any attention to William Papley, if you've been paying any attention to Virgo on September 23rd, you have drank the toxic Kool-Aid. I beseech you in the name of the Lord Jesus, before it's too late, spit it out and don't drink any more of it. The Lord is coming. 
there is a work to do to prepare for his return. The waters are muddled enough. We don't need so-called Christians making them more muddy with nonsense. Yes, I'm angry, but I love the Lord and I love his body. I love Israel and the Jewish people, and I love you. If I didn't, I wouldn't care what you did or what you believed. Spit the poison Kool-Aid out and spit it out now. Stop sipping it. It'll kill you. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.